Pietro Beccari knows luxury. The Italian businessman was chairman and chief executive of Fendi before being named chief executive of iconic brand Dior in 2018. But the world has changed in the past two years. The pandemic has put many industries in crisis mode and some luxury retailers have been hit hard. Shops shut, making the pivot to online even more crucial. Borders closed, hitting the revenue brands bring in from international tourism. It's also highlighted just how fragile the seasonal model of high fashion is. Do consumers need new spring wardrobes if there's nowhere to go? So how did Pietro Beccari lead Dior through the pandemic and keep the business strong through uncertain times? On this edition of Leaders with L'Aqua, we meet the chief executive of Dior. Pietro Beccari, as always, thank you so much for speaking to us on Leaders with L'Aqua. Now, despite COVID-19, you still have pop-ups in Tokyo and London. Are you defying this retail downturn? I believe that people, especially in this moment, need uh, distraction, needs... Uh, uh, you know, the function of luxury, I think, uh, since the very beginning is the same, is in, to give pleasure to people. And probably in this period of time, people need pleasure more than ever. And I think uh, luxury brand uh, should fulfill their original and ancestral role of giving pleasure to people. Uh, and uh, we are going to be present uh, in uh, original stores online, but also with pop-ups, which are, you know, a way for us to give a different surprising side of the brand, uh, wherever it happens to be. How has the pandemic and the lockdown actually, uh, what has it taught you about luxury? Do people buy more online or do, do they still want to see products? How do you think it will change? Christian well, definitely, uh, first of all, I do not know about changes in the future because I see a lot of people uh, taking the world uh, nowadays and, and, and making uh, beautiful forecasts about the future, uh, which I'm probably, uh, too ignorant to do, or I have not such an ambition. I believe that each one of us should look at the at the at the its own brand, its own courtyard, and and do what's best for its own brand. So I tell you what's best for Dior, and I tell you how we uh, we think about uh, uh, this situation. We try to uh, to be optimistic about the future. So I do not know if I will be proven wrong or not so far as you have seen also from the semester result of LVMH. Uh, I cannot discuss figures, but you know that uh, Dior has been mentioned as uh, extremely resilient. Um, we have been, uh, let's say, rewarded with our strategy of uh, trying not to stop activities and to continue uh, uh, to present novelty to customers, uh, which were some, in part locked down, in part were buying from uh, internet, in part were, were buying from closed stores because uh, I take part of the fact that my people uh, volunteered uh, to go to the stores, which were locked down, but also uh, to prepare packaging that were delivered to the home of the customer, which never stopped to like Dior. Uh, so we come out of this uh, stronger as a team. And I don't know about the changes in the future. I think, honestly, that brick and mortar a store will uh, definitely play a major role in luxury also in the future. Uh, and that for luxury brands like Dior, uh, online sales will not uh, surpass uh, 20, 25 percent, even uh, in five, six years. I believe that brick and mortar are super important. For sure, in this period of lockdown, uh, you know, internet sales exploded for every single brand. But I believe that the future will, will see a comeback of brick and mortar stores. And by the way, uh, what I see in people it, is that they look forward to do what they are uh, uh, obliged not to do. So they look forward to try take a plane and travel uh, on the other side of the world. I talk about myself, you know, I've been uh, not traveling for many months and I miss it uh, tremendously. And I think it's so uh, for, for many, many people. So I guess uh, uh, the situation uh, will come back to normal once a vaccine is found. So, so you don't think it, it will accelerate somehow these online shopping trends? You still think you'll have well, bricks and mortars? I, I think it accelerated and I think we will not go back to the period before. So I think in a way it sets a new, a new uh, niveau for the uh, online sales. I agree on that. But I, I also think that brick and mortar will have a, a capital importance for, for, for luxury brand uh, such Dior. Do you think we'll go back to catwalks and fashion shows like we used to have pre-pandemic or are there uh, going to be less or are they going to be less seasonal? I think, again, I do the forecast for, for what concerns Dior, not for the industry. 
I believe that a brand like Dior, which is based on fashion, is based on novelty, is based on injection of excitement, uh, we will need uh, to have a fashion show because also tied to fashion show is a storytelling. A storytelling is what uh, people uh, wants to hear. You know, they are not just buying products. They want to hear beautiful stories and normally beautiful stories that are tied to uh, the storytelling of a fashion show. So I believe that fashion show, at least again, for Dior, will be of capital importance. Coming up, taking the catwalk virtual. So at the end of the day, if you spend uh, the type of money we spent for a show in, uh, in Paris, we don't do it for the 1,500, 2,000 people present there. We do it uh, for the millions watching at home. Just give you a sense of the real-time action. The 10-year yield tumbling now 11 basis points. So continuing in this knee-jerk risk-off field. Dior's Cruise 2021 collection, made up of 90 looks, was presented live to a near-empty audience in Lecce, Italy. It was creative director Maria Grazia Curi's ode to her Italian heritage. Pietro Beccari made the decision to postpone and not to cancel the flagship event, saying he wanted to send a message of hope and support to the world, to the big suppliers and the small ones. The virtual show was a special case due to the pandemic, as fashion contends with unprecedented times. Time is also a fluid concept in the world of fashion, as designers put shows out six months ahead of the season, with winter fashions being showcased on sunny days. But can this trend continue? And will the shift to online become more commonplace? Pietro Beccari is still with us. You were one of the first ones to, to put on a pretty spectacular show in Lecce, Puglia. Did, did, could you measure it directly with sales or was it the buzz created? You know, well, created it's, it's, you know there, is a, there is a measure which is the buzz that you create. And, you know, we had 36 million people viewing directly or indirectly that show in Lecce uh, that we were courageous enough to do and to carry on. Um, so that's the first measure. The rest is, uh, is probably measured in your sales. And uh, you can see the desirability of the brand uh, uh, of today is the sales of tomorrow. That's what I say to my people. So we try to make the brand as desirable as possible because that's uh, the key of your success. And I believe all that, you know, excitement, show storytelling, it, it's what makes the brand exciting and desirable. And that's exactly our job, you know, to make it such. I, I was going to ask you about storytelling in the times of COVID. Does it make it, you know, easier or, or less easy? Because you have, you know, these streaming opportunities, which means that you reach a much wider audience, even maybe younger people. Well, I don't know. Though. I don't make any difference between uh, the show made with an audience and not, because finally, uh, you know, the experience of Lecce has proven that there was the same type of adrenaline, the same type of, uh, of excitement of an artist which is performing without uh, the safety net. Uh, it was a show, even though it was uh, televised and not watched live. So at the end of the day, if you spend uh, the type of money we spent for a show in, uh, in Paris, we don't do it for the 1,500, 2,000 people present there. We do it uh, for the millions watching at home. So I think uh, the substance did not change. Uh, and uh, in that... Uh, in that the objective of a show did not change uh, with the COVID. We do it for the audience at home, mainly. Do, do you get excited or, or do you even get apprehensive right before a show? Does it really make or break a collection, depending well, on I, the publicity uh, it gets? Well, um, I think uh, there is a chemistry and a magic that has, uh, uh, you know, as, as I've seen uh, many, many shows in my life, uh, each one of them is different. Each one of them has a, has a magic and a, let's say, uh, uh, a mix uh, of uh, of clothes, music, and now there are elements of spectacle like uh, the dancers that Marie Grazia wanted to have in, in Lecce, for example. And that has to work. You know, there is, a, there is that one moment in which you know if things work or not. If this mix that you prepared is, is the right one uh, for the audience. What's your biggest headache? Is it managing exclusivity? Is it managing production right now? Or is it something else? No, I, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, production is, is fine. We, we are producing mainly in France and Italy. Uh, and we have artisans in both countries which are very eager uh, to continue doing what they were doing very well before the lockdown. Um, and, uh, you know, company like us, I think we have a, a, a responsibility. And when we talk about social responsibility, we have a responsibility towards these kind of people. Um, so they are producing a maximum effort in order to 
accompany uh, our efforts uh, to be present uh, in in, uh, in the stores with new collections and with uh, fresh collections, and everything is running smoothly. My biggest headache is to is to definitely balance out uh, what is uh, you know the modernity of uh, the freshness of a collection that has to be seasonal and very actual, and the tradition of a brand like Dior, which is uh, very very strong. I think uh, our job is uh, as CEO is, is is always to find this balance in every decision we make, because in every decision we make, either we go left or right, but at the end, the best thing is to have a, a right uh, uh, balance in between. So what do the buyers want right now? Do, do they want this old world glamour? Is it about you know the, the story of Christian Dior almost right from the beginning, or is it something fresh? And that's exactly the point. I think uh, they need the assurance of the history, uh, but uh, they, they want... Uh, the things which are cool right now. So I believe that Mr. Dior said it uh, himself very, very well. He said, uh, we owe to our tradition to be insolent and impertinent because this impertinence and insolence makes uh, this tradition every time again fresh. So that's exactly what we try to do. You know, he, he said that I think very right. So. I know, especially your women's wear was, uh, you know, very implicated in in women rights and representing also um, women filmmakers at the Oscars. Do you think luxury and fashion houses now need to take a stance on cultural issues, on on you know, on uh, on politics, really? Well, I think uh, you know we should keep our main job, which I said it before, is to make uh, people, uh, you know, uh, give some joy, some pleasure, some self reward. To themselves, I think that's our major role, and I think we should stick to it. Is undoubted. Uh, is, is difficult to doubt on the fact that our visibility of millions of people watching, uh, our, you know, role of being admired and looked at, uh, you know, uh, as to let us think on the fact that we can help passing messages and we can help supporting certain causes, which uh, we try to do. Um, you know, Marie Gracia and Kim. Uh, our two designers very involved with that, and I and I think that they feel very much their role in that sense. They feel the role of creative director to the beautiful product, but also they want to do it in a way uh, which is you know in which is possible to launch also social messages which are very important, like feminism for Marie Grazia uh, and uh, and the other causes like you know Kim Jones work with Amora Kobuafo, which is an incredible African artist from Ghana. Uh, and uh, we supported this artist and his foundation uh, through the show. So I think, you know, every time again, uh, we have an occasion to do both, do beautiful things that people like and enjoy, but at the same time to be uh, socially responsible. How closely do you work with the designers? Are you, you, are you, you know, a numbers man or do you actually get involved with the collection that, and, that, that and trends? A, that is another balance, talking about balance, you know, and, uh, you know, the between designer and CEO, uh, each one of us, as an envy to do the job of the other, you know? Designers sometimes would love to do stores and to come into numbers. And uh, we, CEO, like to do products and to tell them what they have to do. I think that uh, the secret is to find the right balance, to let them do and to let them free uh, to create, but to gain sufficiently uh, your credibility and capacity uh, to, tell, to tell them what you think and eventually to direct, uh, uh, you know, their, their collections in the, in the proper way, commercially speaking. So I believe Again, that's the balance, and each one of us has to find his own space. Uh, and uh, you know, we, if we are good enough to find tolerance for uh, being very open, not say critics, but let's say exchange very openly on topics, then uh, you know, that's, that's the healthiest uh, thing that can happen between CEO and designer. How important are collaborations? So you had this very successful collaboration with Air Jordan and the 1OJ sneakers or trainers. Yeah. And how many more of those kind of collaborations do, do you want to have? Exactly. This is a good question for uh, the creative directors, not for me. See, <laughs> I respect my role <laughs> of CEO. Uh, I can only say that, uh, you know, uh, both Marigas and King collaborate with uh, great artists, uh, great uh, directors like uh, Garone, it has been the case for Marie Gracia and the Haute Couture uh, digital show that we did and, and, and Kim as uh, several artists uh, in his pocket still. I believe it's, it's important uh, to respect the tradition of Mr. Dior being uh, himself a collectioner and also a gallerist at one point in time in his life. And I think in the DNA of Dior, there is this uh, 
love for art and collaboration. So I believe it will continue, but I cannot tell you when and how because that's really their job. From a small town in Normandy to a global luxury icon, the heritage, legacy, and reach of Christian Dior. Next. Look, Mr. Dior, I think, uh, was an extraordinary genius. One name that's synonymous with haute couture is Christian Dior. With his debut show in 1947, the French designer from Normandy managed to single-handedly redefine women's style. After years of war and restraint, he established Paris as a center of the fashion universe. His new look collection was characterized by cinched waists, full skirts, and an extravagant use of fabric that contrasted sharply with the sober styles of the racial era. It was intended as a celebration of femininity and the return of luxury. The rest is history. Throughout the next 10 years, Dior became the brand of movie stars and royalty and revolutionized the way the industry did business. What is the legacy of Monsieur Dior's leadership in the fashion world? We're still with Pietro Beccari, the chief executive of Dior. How often do you think about what Mr. Dior would have done in your shoes? How important is it uh, to I, I always go back to the roots? Look, Mr. Dior, I think, uh, was an extraordinary genius uh, who created in 10 years only, if you think about it, he founded this company in 47 and he died in 57. Uh, he created uh, the new look and he had the courage uh, to uh, found his own company just after the war. So imagine, you know, the courage, the entrepreneurial ship, the ambition that he had. And I tell my people that we are not here to preserve or to, or to think uh, about the company, something that we need to preserve because Mr. Dior never did so. He always thought about the future. So I tell them we just are here to find back the spirit of that moment in time in which he decided to found this company. If you find back that spirit, uh, that ambition, uh, that courage, uh, then we'll do the right thing for Dior. Who is the ideal Dior customer? It's difficult to say. I think that, you know, a luxury brand that wants to be global, uh, a multi-billion dollar business, uh, has to talk to several types of customers. That cannot be only one, you know. Uh, and our collection and our stores are big enough uh, to satisfy the young and the less young, the more classic and the more sportive. I think uh, uh, we cannot think only about one customer, but definitely uh, is a sophisticated customer uh, of every age. Uh, is someone uh, looking for elegance uh, with a twist. Uh, is someone that loves quality. Does the American luxury shopper buy differently to the Chinese luxury shopper? Is it, you know, does one go after couture more and the other's sneakers? I don't know if you section that like that. But... No, I think that, uh, you know, the, the customers are uh, of every kind in every, in every region of the world. And uh, in particular, if we look at Chinese uh, type of uh, consumption, uh, they've been sophisticating very, very much their approach. So I think uh, the stereotype of Chinese buying uh, sneakers or buying, uh, uh, let's say, more comfortable products is a bit, uh, is a bit uh, obsolete. Um, so there are all type of customer, more comfort line, couture customer in every region of the world, especially in China. You know, uh, aside of this exhibition, uh, we presented the collection of high jewelry of Victoire de Castellan, which is our uh, creative director of, uh, of uh, high jewelry, and it was an enormous success. So together with the exhibition, we sold uh, more than 100 pieces of high jewelry, and that to Chinese customer. If um, if you if you were to have a looking glass and look in, in the next 10 years, what are the big trends in fashion? I don't know whether it's, you know, secondhand <laughs> clothing that that uh, will really pick up, or more personalized shopping. Like, what are the big trends that you see developing, having an impact at Dior? Well, I think that you know personalization and, uh, and uh, a type of uh, personalization that can go from uh, the typical customized product with your name on it uh, to the personalized the type of uh, luxury experience that a brand can offer to you. I believe that's, uh, that's a mega trend uh, that will exist uh, 10 years from now. For the rest, as I told you, I think uh, uh, the brick and mortar stores will, will still have a capital importance because they give you the chance to present your set of values, your set of aesthetic value uh, 
uh, and to tell stories. Pietro Beccari, how have you changed as, as a leader in the fashion world? How I trained. Changed. <laughs> I'm feeling, uh, changed, trained. I'm sorry. I thought uh, you said train, but training, I'm still training, so <laughs> that's not a problem. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I do not know. Uh, you know, many people expect many changes after this COVID. Uh, definitely something will change. Uh, as, I, as you said, you know, uh, online sales accelerated. Um, but uh, I expect the world to uh, come back to, uh, you know, having uh, really a strong push for traveling because everybody will want to travel at one point in time. Uh, and I think uh, this will be a, a surprise for many because, uh, uh, you know, for Norman, it's difficult to imagine a world where, you know, everybody will travel again freely, airport will be full of people. Uh, but if I close my eyes and I look at the future, I see that. How, how, what kind of leader are you? Have you changed? Do, do you empower your employees more than in the past? Uh, no, I think I, I apply illuminated leadership, I call it. Highlighted leadership. I don't know how you say dictator, dictatorship, not leadership. I don't know <laughs> if I'm a dictator or not, but I think in luxury, you need to listen to everybody. At the end, you have to decide yourself. And that's what I do with my people. Of course, I listen to everybody. I try to let them express. I call. Uh, I say that I like to have a company of, uh, of small alchemists. Everybody in his own role, his own old department, should know that they can make a difference with a good idea. They can always uh, open the door and tell me this is a good idea. And then, you know, as I said, uh, we will decide yes or no, but we will listen to, to, to everybody. During the COVID, I decided to come in the office every day uh, as a captain on, on the boat. I think it was very symbolic because the boat was... Uh, in the middle of a, of a difficult uh, period. Uh, the sea was rough, uh, but you know, I had many, many conversations uh, through these beautiful uh, uh, new tools for me, which is uh, uh, Zoom or, or, or Teams. And um, I had the chance to be close to them and to be even closer to them than probably I was in the past. So it was a, a great experience in that sense. Uh, do you think there are too many fashion brands in general? Or are, are, are <laughs> no. we over luxurified? I don't know. I, I don't think so. You know, if, if a luxury brand exists uh, and is, uh, you know, uh, worth existing is because there is an audience and there is a client for that luxury brand. So I think it's right that it exists. So um, there is, of course, a Darwinism in that. Uh, and uh, the brand which have no more an audience uh, or they lost it or they lost desirability, they will disappear. But to the question, if there are too many, there are as many as they should be. What's your best piece of advice that you've either been given or that you have given to someone? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I just have here on my desk uh, a book. If you want, I show it to you. Uh, it, it says, uh, I don't know if you if you see it. It say that you uh, always have to be a little bit unsatisfied with what you do, you know. And I think uh, that's what I try to do here. The this is a book of Ogilvy. It's an advertising agency that worked with us several times in the past. And, uh, and Mr. Ogilvy wrote this beautiful book, which is The Eternal Pursuit of Unhappiness. I think to be never too satisfied, not too long about what you do is, is a good school. Uh, and uh, here at LVMH, you are master of that. I think uh, that's the best piece of advice that I got from my bosses. And so, I try to give it back to my people. Pietro Beccari, thank you so much for speaking to us today. It was a great pleasure having you again. Thank you, Francine.